Abby Wambach, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I have <laughs> listened to so many episodes and I'm such a huge fan of yours. And I just, Thank you. I love how you do your life and work. Thank you. I appreciate that. Right back at you. And I, the last time you, you did make it an appearance, but um, nobody would have known about it because you were doing the tech for your <laughs> wife when uh, Glennon Doyle, when she uh, showed up on the uh, on the uh, on this podcast several months ago. And I remember there was somebody like kind of at the base of her chair, like t toggling with some knobs or something. I was like, is that Abby Wambach doing tech for, for Glennon Doyle? And yes, it was. It was. So. It was. And it always <laughs> is the tech part of Glennon's brain. We all have certain strengths and that's just not one of Glennon's, and, but it's one of mine. So it gives me some worthiness. You know, I have I have a, a, a place in this family. <laughs> I think you have a place in, that goes well beyond tech, but um, I'm sure we'll get to that. Let, let me start at a bit of a, a sensitive spot. You and I were chatting right before we started rolling, and I was just kind of asking you what was on your mind of late. And you you said grief. Are you comfortable talking a little bit about what, why that is so, such a salient emotion for you now? Yeah. Well, my brother passed away uh, at the beginning, at the end of last year, at the end of 2023. And it was a tragic death. He was 51 years old and um, leaves behind three children. And it just was, it's the first big tragic death in my immediate family, the, my birth family. Um, and so kind of wading through the muck of that, um, you know, early days you go into like survival, right? Like what needs to be done, planning all the services and getting home and calling your your family and talking to them and really processing it one step at a time. Uh, and then what inevitably happens is you step back into your real life and you wrestle with this whole thing. Um, a lot for me has been done privately because I live so far from my, my birth family. They're in upstate New York and I live in California. Uh, and so there was like a loneliness to it. There's a, there's the athlete part of me that's like, oh, well, you know, this is just life and I can just, I can just like work my way. I can just keep on keeping on and it's all going to be fine. Well, you know, grief knocked on my door. Actually, grief <laughs> broke through my door about four weeks ago and, and, and forced itself into my, my house and, and, and into my life. And it's just totally floored me. I've gotten sick, which I very rarely get sick. Uh, I think my immune system kind of shut down. I uh, haven't been able to do like my, I'm a very regimented person uh, for various reasons. But, you know, talking with my therapist and stuff, I've really learned so much about the things that I never really wanted to think about through this process of grief. Um, she explained to me that it's like this portal that opens up when some sort of tragedy happens in a person's life, whether it's a, a death or even a near death experience or a diagnosis. Um, there's this portal that opens up to what matters most. Like you get to like leave all the BS behind and it's like, what really matters? And Though it's really hard, it's like staring at the sun, um, it hurts and it's scary and it's confusing and nothing really makes sense. But because that portal's open, you have you have the ability to kind of go towards and face some of these fears. So I have this extraordinary fear, or I've I should say I have always had an extraordinary fear of death. Like, what is actually happening there? What What is the experience? Um, and, and this portal opening has given me a little bit of breath and time to kind of work into it. I'm not sa sitting here saying I figured it all out. But, man, grief is really something. It has kind of brought me to my knees. And this is actually the first time I've, I've experienced real grief sober. Um, I'm almost eight years sober early April. And so what I've noticed is that grief has this train of all the cars of grief that you've ever experienced. And it's like carrying all of the, the long and the history of 
the 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 trauma or you know the grief of losing your childhood or um you know heartbreaks like it it's just this long train and so that kind of just like flowed right into my home many weeks ago and it totally floored me i've been like kind of sad and the word i've been using is I, i've been filled with sorrow done quite a bit of work around it a lot of bargaining trying to understand it trying to figure it out a lot of negotiating like how could this happen and all of these questions and i'm i've landed today because tomorrow could be different that i along with everybody else on the planet have no freaking clue <laughs> what is happening or what happens when we die and I will never know. And I am learning to start to think about accepting that as my reality. <laughs> now, I don't know how long it will take for me to actually accept it, but that's where I'm at. Um, so yeah, that's that's a little bit about my story. I have some questions, but first, two, two things to say. First of all, um, I'm very sorry about your loss. That's That sucks. Uh, second is eight years sober is a massive achievement. And so congratulations. Thank you. And that, that's, that's a really big deal. The question I have, or I guess it's more of an observation or a commiseration, is, is, is this delayed reaction piece of it. Um, I just came from a funeral this past weekend, not, not a me member of my immediate family. It was a very close college friend of mine um, and spent quite a bit of time with his wife and children. And I can see it with them that, you know, they're in, it's been two months since uh, Ed died. And they've been in this go, go, go mode of sorting out the finances, setting up this incredible, incredibly beautiful memorial that they that that I went to over the weekend. And it reminds me of of when I was a journalist. I used to interview people in the aftermath of terrible tragedies, you know, parents who'd lost children, people in war zones, people in the, you know, after earthquakes or tornadoes. And and there was this almost like a a giddiness sometimes, you know, like it, 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 I, it wasn't real for them yet. And my fear for Ed's, my friend Ed's wife and children is, and, and they were are able to articulate it. So I, I think they see what's coming is that once the, the motion stops, the emotion is going to come in. And anyway, so I just said a lot of words. Does that all sound familiar given what you've, what you're going through? So familiar. I mean, death is is dramatic, right? And I'm sure that there's probably some science. I don't know it, um, but I'm sure that there's some sort of physiological science and response that's happening in our bodies, um, whether it's pro you know promoting more adrenaline or or um, dopamine during these times, so that we can actually survive. Probably survival mechanisms in place when real trauma hits and re real grief hits. Um, and, and that can't be forever lasting. Right. And so when those settle down, um, I know that that feels like it was the case for me. I was like kind of riding this high, so to speak, um, the grief train. And there's just so much to manage around somebody's life, especially, especially when somebody tragically passes away. Um, whom happens to be your brother and whom happens to have three children and, you know, dealing with all of the stuff around, you know, his assets and, and, and stuff, you know, way going through and um, talking to his children and figuring out, you know, what their situation is. And it's just not, it's not, and the problem is, is they have, I'm sure a state, attorneys and lawyers and doctors and stuff and uh, morticians have a checklist of all the things that you need to get through. And that that's great. And every person who dies is very individual and different and have and their needs are going to be different. And so trying to manage all of that takes a certain amount of energy. So it's it's I, I felt this way because I had to deliver his eulogy. I was like kind of mind over mattering so much of my personal experience in those weeks after he passed away 
so that I could get through it, knowing kind of in the back of my head, like, I'm just going to have to deal with this later. You know, luckily, um, the later wasn't too far down the road. Uh, I've been, you know, it's just hard. It's hard to understand that somebody was here and then they're not. And they never will be. You know, death is so permanent. It's just such a permanent <laughs> endeavor. Um, and then you have to kind of rewrite the story that you had of yourself. You have to reclaim or say things different. Like, you know, I have six brothers and sisters and five are still living. Like that never occurred to me before that I would have to maybe do some math when it relates to like telling the story of my life. And so it's just, and it's just, it's so sad. And we, we miss him so much. And he was such an important person in all of our lives. And yeah, I get it. I get that it might look like grief. I, I do think grief will show up if these folks, you know, cause I think for me in my alcoholic um, prescription pill days, I was more keen on on just drinking away my sorrow or pretending to drink away my sorrow uh, than actually ever dealing with it. And so I feel grateful for my sobriety to kind of wholeheartedly experience grief completely conscious and awake and aware. And it sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> like there is a good reason why so many alcoholics out there drink because it is hard and it is painful. And I, I definitely use alcoholism as a survival mechanism, as a, as a self-soothing and a self-medicating to, to deal with the problems and issues I, was, I wasn't capable of emotionally handling. And so it feels really good that I'm capable of doing it sober um, and completely awake. And when, the, when this grief shows up, it's like, it just has totally floored me. And I'm a very like optimistic and positive person. And even my wife, she's like, hey, like, are you doing OK? <laughs> like it's it's disconcerting when you see somebody who's for the most part. Chooses to live happy and positively. And 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 then that person is a little bit more not that I, I wouldn't even say negative because it's it's just like I'm just sad a lot mm. and trying to manage feeling sad a lot is tough for somebody like me for sure has it been a challenge to your sobriety no not at all um god that ship has so long sailed uh thank goodness it makes me feel um super grateful like even more it's like this doubling down because even though it's hard like I feel deeply that I'm living in it I'm like among it and that knowing how almost flippant like and short life can be I will be able to feel like I've lived so fully in these last eight years of my sobriety and that's it's the one of the things that I feel like most proud of in terms of my life's achievements. Am I hearing you correctly in, in that in wrestling with this radical subtraction, like the death of of somebody you love so much, your brother, as 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 much as it sucks to use your word, that it it might actually be uh like an opportunity for growth? Yeah. Well, yes. And I also I might be a little bit woo woo about this stuff um, because I think that there is growth opportunity in everything that we do. Um, not be and, and truly like I'm not like, oh, yay, grief. My brother died. I'm going to learn something about it. It just felt like such an obvious thing that I had been and have been avoiding my whole life. Like. This is why my therapist said that this portal opens up because it's happening to you. You have lost somebody. You can't not know that this thing happens. The rest of us, you know, before my brother died, I was just walking around the world pretending like we weren't all just going to die one day. <laughs> like, and and P.S., I think that we need to to live that way at times 
because it's a hard truth to carry at the front of your mind all the time. And, you know, all the greatest spiritual teachers in the world, they they keep death at the forefront. They keep it at their fingertips so that they can live as present and fully in the here and in the now. Because the truth is we just don't know when death will show up at our door and and come knocking. And so to me, it's like this, it's like a balance of trying not to become so obsessed with it because I'm not going to be a spiritual guru. But it's this balance of keeping it at the forefront and at least for right now, as my portal of this is open, to really f- work through some of the fear of, around death because I don't want to get to the end of my life and experience real fear. I want to experience real acceptance and a surrendering, and that I think will take some time for me. But, but I get a pit in my stomach when I think about that moment that I know I'm dying. I, I I truly like I still to this day like it's it's something that I am working through and I mean you know my brother has just experienced this transition to whatever might be on the other side I'm not I'm not a religious person by any means I grew up in the Catholic Church um and I don't know I I will never know what happens when we die but I. I feel a little bit more comforted comforted knowing that my brother went through it and I knew him for so long and that maybe he's like getting it ready for the rest of us. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's something that I like to think that maybe he's just over there um, setting up the house for the rest <laughs> of us for when it's our time. I, I am definitely not um, unafraid of death. Interestingly, my friend Ed, uh, who just died recently, I had a couple of long phone conversations with him as he was dying, and he was unafraid, <laughs> like totally unafraid. In fact, the last conversation he had with his wife, they were in the hospital for what was going to be just like a regular checkup, and he started to throw up, and they were taking him to the ICU, and she said he just he was not afraid of dying. Um, but I'm not anywhere close to Ed. I'm way closer to your camp. But it is comforting to think billions of people have had the experience. You know, it's like, I, we will not be the first. Right. Um, and I find that reasonably comforting, actually. Yeah. It's good to think about. I've actually never thought of it like that. <laughs> I only think about the billions who will experience it, not yeah. the billions who have. That's smart. That's really good, Dan. I, I will not claim that as my own. Um you 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 made a few references, Abby, to your past experiences with substance. Um, you're in good company or bad company, given that I have plenty of experiences with substance abuse myself. Um, you said a thing back in 2016 um, after you you were arrested for DUI in 2016, and you said something that I I wrote down here that I wanted to ask you about because I think. It's it's of personal interest to me. You said the number one thing I could do for myself was start loving myself again. The choice to do that saved my life. Now, self love um, can be a bit of a like a, you know, just like the type of shit that the spin instructor yells at you from the front of the you know uh, exercise class. What do you mean by it, and how did it save you? Well, this is actually kind of interesting because. I knew that that was that was my way. Like sobriety was the beginning, like choosing to no longer bring substances into my life to cover up the pain that I was internally feeling or numb. Those first days was like the first step toward loving myself. And the truth is, I'm almost eight years sober. And all this time, I've kind of been like looking around at all these other people, my wife, who's 20 years plus sober. And I'm like, I'm like looking to see how they love themselves. Like, I don't get it. Like, I, I don't understand the concept. I, get, I, I, I intellectually understand the concept. But I don't understand the practical way in which somebody then 
just goes about loving themselves. And the reason why is because there are so many parts of my personality that have reached outside of myself, whether it be soccer, whether it be drugs or alcohol, for pleasure, for worthiness. And that was how I thought love felt, like self-love felt. I thought going out there for affirmation, uh, for accolades, for awards, for certificates, whatever, for degrees, I thought that that was how I showed love to myself. And I was very wrong. <laughs> I didn't understand that it's an inside job. The way that I love, the way that I actually feel love for my wife and my children, the way that that feels on the inside of my body feels like like this this expression out. And I was never able to like put my finger on that exact feeling for myself. So what is myself? Like, what is my consciousness? What are all of these, these, you know, the rungs of the ladder that I've climbed so that I could be worthy or have some power or fame or whatever it is? Like, what is it all for? And I do think, at least for me, my journey is the exploration of love, both learning how to find it inside of myself and also the expression of love, because I love that. Like, it's a thing that I really value about myself is my ability to express love and and show the love that I have for the people that I love in my in my life. But it, this self love concept, like an idea, always kind of felt like something that other people had access to that I didn't. And it's literally not until the seventh year of my sobriety, and I don't know why that number is important to me or even is important, but it feels kind of important, that I started to ask Glennon, like, do you love yourself? She's like, yeah, of course I love myself. And I'm like, but how? Like, how does that work? And honestly, the more therapy, because I started doing therapy for this reason about six, seven months ago, to literally learn how to love myself. and. To me, like real love, even the way that I express my love for Glennon is like, it's like an acceptance of that person fully and totally. And that is something that I didn't understand. I didn't understand that love, the way that I define love is just like, like accepting fully somebody's full humanity. And I think that I had to get far enough away from the parts of myself that needed to feel the protector parts of myself that needed to feel safe. Uh, and, and so that those parts use drugs and alcohol to feel safe. I needed to get far enough away so that I didn't feel any more shame around those times of my life so that I could fully accept even the parts of myself that on paper look like fucked up you know, can I even say fucked up on this? Yeah. On paper, yeah. look a little less attractive, right? Like, but the, the irony is like, I feel so proud of my sobriety. Like the, the amount of pride that I feel for myself and love I have for myself for my sobriety is directly linked to how fucked up I was <laughs> during the time in which I was abusing it. Do you know what I mean? So like you can't have one without the yeah, other. And exactly. so coming to that understanding has been really helpful for me. And I tell this to a lot of newly sober folks, the pride that you will feel from overcoming is so important. And also the amount and the depth of your use and abuse is often related to the increase in pride that you have, like the bigger the mountain that you have to climb. Um, and so there's no shame in the depths that you've dug yourself, right? Like there isn't. We're all, we're all just kind of like walking around here like, what is going on? 
I don't understand. And then emotions come up. I don't understand. And we are all born and raised in different families and in different cities and in different states and maybe even in different countries. And so we all have like different understandings of the way things are. And sometimes the way things are don't match with the way things are insides need them to be. Um, so yeah, I've done a lot of therapy around it. And my gosh, like that that DUI in 2016 was at the time, God, I, f I felt so certain that my life was over, that I would never be able to survive this, that my public image was now forever scarred. And wouldn't you know, it was the very best thing that ever could happen to me. And I don't condone my behavior because I don't believe um, that it's ever good to drink and drive. And I was super sick. And, um, and I needed that to happen and I needed it to be so public. I needed my, my, my mugshot to be on the bottom of the ESPN ticker for a week. I needed that. It was so important for me and the kind of person that I am. And it, it woke me up. It was the thing that woke me up out of the trance. And it was like this beautiful opportunity that was like, come back to life. Here we are. You, you can do this. And so, yeah. The 10% Happier Podcast is available ad-free over on our companion meditation app, which is also called 10% Happier. And uh, you will get uh, the episodes a week before everybody else does. Download the 10% Happier app right now to get started for free. I really like what you're saying about like uh, about self-love. It's it's it's. I uh, like so many of the things you just said, but specifically about self-love that that it is the same thing as loving anybody else. It has, at least in my mind, two component parts. One you listed, which is acceptance. And acceptance doesn't mean ha you're necessarily psyched about it, but um, that you, you do accept it. Um, and the second is like wanting the best for that person or for yourself. Mm. Um and so it, it it doesn't need to be it it's actually not as as cheesy as all the Instagram latte foam art um it, hashtag blessed versions of it it it's actually pretty down to earth um and and the how of it is you know kind of up to you but there are meditation practices that are good for this there are therapies good for this you know having good friends or a good good romantic partner is part of this um but yeah, the way you see it is, I think, kind of the way I've seen it. Totally. I love that, like wanting, I like that second piece to this, like accepting somebody for who they are, yourself included, and also wanting the best for them and yourself. Like, gosh, like if we could all just operate more through and from that perspective with life, I think the world would definitely be a, a much nicer place. But for me, I think what's what's compelling is that that basic friendliness, you can call it love, I mean, friendliness, benevolence, is a trainable skill. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that's the radical part of this, that you, you know, I'm particularly interested in meditation, but uh, as a way to train it, but I'm not a fundamentalist in this regard. I think there are lots of ways to do it. Just because you happen, you might feel hatred <laughs> on a daily basis doesn't mean that you're immune to this training. Like I feel it too. And I've done a lot of this training. Um, and just because you hate yourself or other people doesn't mean you're, you, you're, you can't boost your warmth quotient. You, you can, and you know, you're w living proof of that having gone from a pretty low, low in 2016 to where you're at now. Yeah. You know, I consider myself to be probably overly kind. Um, Because that's a virtue of mine. It's a value of mine. I think that we all have a responsibility in every room we walk into. We all affect it, right? And having been on team, team, in team sports my whole life, I'm keenly aware of every energy that walks into a room. Now, I'm not an empath, which is really interesting because empath then takes on the energy as their own. I am somebody who's very observant and I can sense energy, but I don't let it come into effect me. 
And I think like, I don't know, I don't know if this is true or not, but in my experience, it takes more energy to be cold than warm. <laughs> By the looks on the cold people's faces versus the warm people's faces, you will see somebody who feels open versus somebody who feels a little bit more clenched. Somebody who is curious versus somebody who's judgmental. And I understand that sometimes we are, we have these notions or we have these lives that for whatever reason force us into wanting to be more open and warm versus cold and, and judgmental. I get it. And like you said, it's something that we can learn, right? It could be either through meditation. Um, it could also be through journaling. It could be through gr gratitude journals. It could be through, for me, learning what actually builds my own self-esteem. I think that we, in our culture of capitalism, of thinking that I will feel happy or better when I make this much money or when I have this many cars or if I have children who are going and I can pay for them to go to college, like whatever these like stories that we tell of ourselves. We forget about the fundamental need to feel good about ourselves first. Like what really makes me feel good about me? And so I've actually thought about this a lot since retiring, you know, eight, nine years ago, because I was a really confident soccer player. And soccer brought me so much self-esteem. Playing on the best team in the world brought me so much self-esteem, right? And so when I retired, I was very concerned with how I was going to feel about myself. Like, and this is actually what was the big indicator of my substance abuse at the time is I was really nervous about my retirement. I didn't know what the hell I was going to be. So since sobriety has, has really taken a front seat in my retirement, I have learned the things in my life that bring me self-esteem or actually suck self-esteem away from me. And I really try very hard to do the things in my life every day, even the sh stuff that I don't want to do, like work out every day and, you know, sit down and, and do an hour of, of busy work or 30 minutes of busy work to make sure the family is organized or, um, you know, whatever it is, like have to drive my kids and sit through another soccer practice or another soccer game, like in the parking lot, by the way, folks, don't go sit and watch your kids practices. Let them go out there on their own. Sit your ass in the car. Do not go and watch their practice. Practices really? are for them. Yes. Just a little tip, little parenting tip there. Huh. Self-esteem is like the most important fundamental thing for me as, as, as at the basis of how I get to learn what my own process and feeling of self-love and self-acceptance looks like. Because um, I do want to feel like not that I'm winning at life, but that like I am doing the best that I possibly can right now. And P.S. like these last couple of weeks when grief hit, the best I possibly could do was like one hour of work. And then I would go lay down for the rest of the day. And I kept asking Glennon like, are you OK? Like, I'm so sorry because I'm a caretaker by nature and I have a role in my family and you know, food needs to be cooked and fed to the to the family and the kids. And she just kept saying, like, of course I'm okay. And I want you to to rest and take this time. Cause it's precious. These like, I don't know, th these moments where the world does get to slow down and almost come to a stop. Like we can think, oh God, this is so uncomfortable as it has been. It's also precious because it's allowing me to fill up and to to have faith that I can take care of myself 
even when tragedy strikes. Faith that self-esteem and the way we build it in a normal day might look different when you're suffering or you're going through some sort of tragedy. Like the world is not, you can't just get up and check a list every single day because we're all such complicated beings. We have so many different things that are always, we're always siphoning through. And so it's not like a one size fits all. Like, yeah, I do have a bunch of stuff that usually make me feel pretty good about myself that have not worked over the last three weeks that have had no impact and no increased value in my life. So I just, do I keep doing them or do I just like sit and do a proper, um, you know, sitting, it's like my sitting Shiva, like the Jewish, the thing that Jewish folks, folks do after death. It's the, it's the way it's like, you just got to sit in, in it. You got to sit in it and let it move through you. But I'm still kind of in it too. So it's like the, the first day that I felt like I'm a little bit more normal than I have felt over the last three or four weeks. T tell me if I'm hearing this through line correctly. I'm hearing a number of through lines in your comments, but You've used the term self-esteem a lot, and I'm wondering if that's synonymous with worthiness, which you've also used quite a bit. Like even right from the jump, you were joking about how your being good at the tech gives you a sense of worth within the family. And um, and then, of course, when you retired, you wondered a lot about where am I going to get my worthiness from and, and ended up reaching reflexively for substances again no judgment that's a move i've personally made myself am i hearing this correctly like this this seems to be a, a big theme in your mental in your interior life yes and i would say the first half of my life was dominated by worthiness and needing other people's approval and the last eight to nine years of my life has been dominated with self-esteem needing my own need for approval and of course, like I want my wife to approve and I want my children to approve of me that I, I feel like those are supernatural ways to interact in a marriage and in relationship with your children. Um, and I have values that I live by, but rather than the outside in world being the way that I live, I'm trying to live inside out. Uh, and that has actually been a really hard thing for me to completely get my mind around because since the time I was a baby, I have been reaching out there for my own sense of worthiness, reaching out there so that somebody can say that that's good enough. You know, it's like, it's like when you go and, and, and I'm sure that this was the case for my parents, but I can remember, uh, countless games when I was a kid and I would score a goal and I would look over to make sure that my mom and dad or my mom was there at least and they were watching and so it's like every single time looking over to see if they're watching and actually in fact one of our really good friends her daughter is just starting to play soccer and she couldn't be at her game and her daughter happens to score in this game and I had to explain to her this might be a hard experience right now and it might be a really interesting conversation to start having with your kid about why you're doing this why are you out there are you out there so that you can look on the sidelines and to make sure that your mom or parents are watching or are you out there because you're it's filling you up like it's just it's a, it's a, it's an important thing. So yeah, worthiness, self-esteem, they're very similar. I also think that they're almost, there's like the, they're right on the edge of the opposite sides of the coin. One is more from the inside out and the other is the outside in. Very practically, what have you done that has given you, that has helped you move from external validation to internal validation? Well, I, I failed at it at first for a pretty long while because I just kind of went to what I knew. So early on in my retirement, uh, I, I decided to train and run in the New York City Marathon. Um, and that was great, but that was all for external. That was all so that it could be cool 
look cool so that my family thought I was cool, all that stuff. And I realized that there's this link also with professional athletes um, with suffering and self-esteem. The more you suffer, the more you feel better about yourself. And like there's that's just like a never ending um, game that you're playing with yourself. So I decided to go to go one full year This is a couple years ago now. I wanted to go one full year without suffering physically um, because I was getting so much. I'd just go for a long run and that and I would suffer through it and I'd hate every second of it. But when it was done, I'd feel really good about myself. The dopamine would and the adrenaline would spike and I'd be like pumped. I didn't want that. Like it just that doesn't feel like such a a balanced way of living. It feels like I was like sobering up from professional sports because there is a trauma. There is there is there is an unraveling to that whole world, the way of thinking, the way of actually being. So I spent a whole year um, suffering, er, I'm sorry, not suffering physically. And so I would go on walks. I would go to the gym down down from where, my, where I live and lift with, with other people for 50 minutes. And it would be like super low key, nothing hardcore. There's no like maxing reps. It's just like getting your heart rate up a little bit. I'd go surfing. I'd go golfing. I like started to like trend to doing things that I enjoyed doing, like truly enjoyed doing. And I did not understand that that was an association most people make with their fitness <laughs> regimens, that they do things that they kind of enjoy. And that has totally changed my life. Showing up every day is a virtue of mine, regardless of whether I want to do it or not. Uh, some people call it behavior activation. Um, I just also subscribe to like the fact that motivation doesn't always come. And in fact, for me personally, as it relates to even fitness, Anytime I have to do something fitness wise, I don't even want to do it. It's the thing that's hard to do. Right. And so I have learned that there's like this push to do certain things like this excitement, this draw. And those are usually things that I love to do. Um, and so like that excitement and the looking forward to it is its own joy. Then there's other things that I do that. I am having so much enjoyment in it that I I didn't even think about it beforehand. It's just happening. And then there's other things that I get so much fulfillment when I'm done with it. And I give both all three of those things same values. I don't say, oh my gosh, I'm only going to participate in the things that I feel excited about doing because then I'll never work out and I'll never feel healthy, right? Because the truth is the value is true across all of that board, right? Like I really do love planning a good trip and looking forward to it for a few months. And then I also really love being in the middle uh, uh, on a surfboard waiting for waiting for a wave. I also look forward to surfing. Um, and then I really love feeling the way that I feel on my walk home from the gym every single weekday. Like, I love that that part of it. I don't like the, the 55 minutes before or the hour before or pressing the button on my app to have to, like, sign up for the class the night before. Like, those are not times where I'm feeling like I look forward to it. But I do appreciate that walk home and the, the next couple of hours and the way that I feel about myself for the rest of the day. So, yeah, I think I got off tangent there. But I think I hear something actually quite similar to to my conversation with your wife a few months ago, um, which is that a key step in moving from an addiction to external validation to um, relying more on internal validation is just attuning to what you actually like. Now that's, that sounds so basic, but most of us are not socialized to do this. And so it sounds like you've just tuned your dial much more finely to 
what do I actually want and like as opposed to what the world is, is, is expecting of me? That's right. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with patience. I was the most impulsive, impatient person. I want what I want when I want it. That's how I used to think. And I never considered to ask myself this one question, which I think so many of us addicts don't even realize we have access to this one question. And the question is, is that so? Is it true that, you know, because I was married when I was in the height of my addiction and, and honestly, addiction totally ruined my first marriage. I didn't have the skill set to, mostly because I was an alcoholic, uh, but also I didn't have the skill set to work through the problems that I was having in my marriage. And so I just drank my problem away. And that felt easier and in some ways was easier than actually uh, going after and attacking the problem at hand. The truthiest truth, and this is what Glenn and I always talk about, like, is that true? Is that absolutely true? As Byron Katie would, would ask us to, to ask ourselves. Can you know with absolute certainty if that is true? And I didn't know we could ask ourselves these questions. I didn't know that I didn't need to have an answer. I didn't know that the world is very hard and confusing. And I didn't know that you could live it without the need or the, what I felt like the requirement of alcohol was. So, yeah, I mean, it's the reason why I was using is because I was afraid and I didn't ask myself um, if it was true that there wasn't another way, it just felt like the only option, the only way, you know, and I, and I was conditioned to believe as we all are in mainstream America, everybody's drinking and every TV show you watch and in every, um, you know, in every circle you even run in, there's so many drinkers, um, some of which are perfectly fine. They have no alcoholism in them. Um, but that, that wasn't me, you know, that wasn't my experience. It's interesting, an observation from me here as we run up against the clock at the end of our time together. You earlier said something about how you're not a spiritual guru. And sure, by using your fame to be totally unguarded about all aspects of your life, I mean, that is a very powerful way to teach people Um so in a, just a long way of saying I'm, I, I'm both impressed by your personal growth and, and grateful to you for being so open about it, because I think that just doing that is is more helpful than you might even know. Yeah, I remember when the DUI happened and I was so worried. I was writing a book at the time because I had just retired and that's what athletes do. I mean, honestly, it's the only way I was going to make money that next year. So I agreed to write a book. And I was really trying to figure out if I was going to include this in my book, this DUI, this jail, like the whole thing. And it's right when I met Glennon and she had said to me, we in the real world like real people. And the only way to go through this part of your story is to tell all of it, because then you will have no skeletons in your closet, because then you will have not to worry 10 years, 20 years down the road, if your children will find out that you, that this happened. And she's like, my rap sheet is long, is as long as your arm. <laughs> There's nothing to be ashamed of here. And the more you can tell your story, the more we can help heal each other. Because yeah, I understand that there are gurus in the world, but like, we're all just people at the end of the day. And we're all just trying to figure this out. And I don't know if I'll ever figure it out, but I do know that I'm not going to shy away from the hard feelings or the hard parts of life. I mean, that's why we have a podcast named We Can Do Hard Things. It's it's the it's it's my vocation. It's what I do 
for my work now. You know, I feel difficult things and I work through them. And I, we, we talk to an incredible amount of people who are also doing the same kind of work. And to me, I used to stand in front of people wearing a jersey and I used to be so incredibly proud. And I am proud of the time that I spent representing this country. But I am absolutely, I, I know for certain that the more I talk about my vulnerabilities, like real vulnerabilities, the more people come up to me now and they thank me for doing that. Because yes, pro athletics is wonderful, entertaining, but nobody ever came up to, my, to me as an athlete and said, you saved my life. Right, and now countless right. people come up to me in the work that I do and say, you've really helped me save my life. And that to me is like so much more profound and powerful. Well said. Yeah, I just want to put in a plug for We Can Do Hard Things, uh, the podcast um, that you co-host with your wife and your sister-in-law and also for your book, Wolfpack. And just thank you for coming on. It's just, just such a pleasure to talk to you. Same. Thank you for having me. And, you know, we got to get you on the podcast one of these days. Anytime. Although I, <laughs> I, I may have the wrong chromosomal structure for your your guest list. Uh, you know what? Meaning. It's true. We, not even on purpose, we didn't even have dudes on our podcast, at least straight white dudes. And we are, we are opening up the aperture for <laughs> folks such as yourself, who could qualify <laughs> and not be shunned by our listener. <laughs> Thank you again for doing this. Really appreciate you. Appreciate you too.